This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. It's Wednesday, May 29th, 2024. I'm Clayton Neville in for John Trout. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Both sides rest their cases in the Donald Trump hush money trial. Michael Cohen is the embodiment of reasonable doubt. I'm John Stolness. More Midwest storms, this time in Texas, knocking down trees and cutting power to hundreds of thousands. We'll have the details. And in Ohio, President Biden will be on the ballots after all. There is a development in another legal case involving Donald Trump, Sagar Magani at the White House. On Wall Street, stocks are coming off a mixed day, but the Nasdaq opens above 17,000 this morning for the very first time. I'm Jessica Edinger. There's been a resentencing hearing for the man who attacked Paul Pelosi. I'm Shelley Adler. An explosion nearly knocks down an Ohio building, and one man completely loses it on a passenger jet. That includes his clothes. All ahead on America in the Morning. The prosecution and defense rested their cases in Donald Trump's hush money trial in New York City. John Stolness has more on their final arguments, what happened outside the courtroom and what's next. The former president left the New York courtroom last night, pumping his fist for the cameras, but without making remarks following the marathon five hour long closing arguments from the defense and prosecution. However, Trump's surrogate spoke for him during the day outside. Donald Trump Jr. attacking the prosecution's star witness, Michael Cohen. This is amazing. I think Todd Blanche summed it up best. If there was an MVP, if there was a goat of liars, it is Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen is the embodiment of reasonable doubt. During his closing remarks, Trump lawyer Todd Blanche once again hammered away at the credibility of Trump's former fixer, calling him the gloat, the greatest liar of all time. Blanche also warning jurors that Stormy Daniels, who Trump is accused of paying hush money to to cover up an affair, cannot be trusted. Prosecutors claimed Trump engaged in a conspiracy to, quote, hoodwink voters in 2016 by paying Daniels and Karen McDougal to keep quiet about their affairs with him. Jurors are expected to begin deliberating today. Meanwhile, the Biden campaign sent actor Robert De Niro to speak to reporters outside the courthouse to warn them of the dangers of another Trump presidency. If he gets in, I can tell you right now, he will never leave. He will never leave. You know that. He will never leave. Trump advisor Jason Miller calling the Biden campaign's decision to send De Niro to campaign at the trial hypocritical and a sign of desperation. And the best that Biden can do is roll out a washed up actor. And don't worry, my remarks will be shorter than the Irishman. I won't make you suffer for three hours, but the best they can do is roll out a washed up actor. At the White House, spokesperson Corrine Jean-Pierre was asked if President Biden plans to make any remarks pending the outcome of the trial. I don't have anything to read out on the president's plan on watching a, a trial. That is just not something that he's focused on. He's focused on the American people. The case now goes to the jury, who must determine if Trump is guilty of 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, charges that could land him up to four years in prison if found guilty. I'm John Stolness. One of the country's biggest metro areas was walloped with an early morning storm yesterday and hundreds of thousands of people are still without power this morning. The cleanup though underway. Cutting fallen trees and clearing debris and massive branches from roads and back alleys. Hurricane force winds as high as 75 miles per hour in parts of Texas as the Houston and Dallas Fort Worth areas were also hit with hail and torrential rain. This Dallas County woman was woken up by the storms. Oh, it was very loud and scary. The windows were rattling. The roof was banging. It was some hail, I believe. And it was just frightening. A massive oak tree that's been standing since she moved into her home in the late 1970s, just across the road, split in half, branches mangled in the street. Looked out the window like I know we shouldn't, but I did, and boom, it went down. Miles down the road, more destruction. I know that the one back there fell across somebody's fence, and that was like two or three feet, right? He said that's about two or three foot thick tree that fell in the backyard? Yeah. yeah. And then the worst one I've seen so far is there's a tree over there, and it looked like someone literally just kind of twisted it. The storms not only knocked down trees, but power lines too. Some trees on top of power lines. Close to 700,000 people at one point in the DFW Metroplex were without power. 
That number closer now to about 300,000. Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins says it'll take time to get all the lights back on. This, unfortunately, will be a multi-day power outage situation, similar to the one that you saw in Harris County and Houston. At least one person was killed in Magnolia, Texas, that after a home under construction collapsed, a boy believed to be the victim. The wind damage and flooding comes just days after seven people were killed in an EF3 tornado in North Texas. We're still in the thick of the severe weather season. Sunday was the busiest severe weather day of the year so far with more than 600 reports of strong winds or hail across more than 20 states. 26 tornado reports were also made in 10 states. At least 22 people killed in storms that stretched through the Memorial Day holiday. Those are the top stories of the day sponsored by Sleep Number. Save 50% on the Sleep Number limited edition smart bet for a limited time only at a Sleep Number store or sleepnumber.com. Democrats in one American state are working to ensure that President Biden is on the ballot in November. We've got the details when America in the Morning returns after this. Some of us, especially those in the plains, waking up this morning to some storm damage from late yesterday, even yesterday morning. Well, we're going to get wet again today in some parts of the country. LaTroy Thornton's here to tell us where. The caboose in a train of recent storms in the east means pop-up showers for places from Maine to southern parts of Michigan today, with a chance for some thunder as well from the Ohio Valley toward Cape Cod by day's end. As this storm train finally leaves the station, so to speak, high pressure builds in from the upper Midwest, which should be in for a rather nice Wednesday overall. This means a break from the rain into the start of the weekend for a good portion of the east, with cooler, less humid conditions as highs only reach the 60s and 70s for many, from the Great Lakes to the Mid-Atlantic and points northward. Looking to the center of the country, Tuesday brought severe weather, including damaging wind and hail from Texas into eastern Colorado, where a landspout tornado was even reported late Tuesday afternoon. As a complicated weather pattern lingers over the general region, today and even Thursday are expected to bring more of the same, with a potential for hail and damaging winds lifting even farther to the north through Thursday, extending from border to border, including areas from North Dakota to coastal southeast Texas. Not every location will have severe weather both days, but it will be important to stay weather aware until the threat passes as the disturbance shifts out of the area to end the week. Farther west, showers continue in the Pacific Northwest today, and thunder showers develop as well this afternoon from eastern Idaho across Montana and perhaps into Utah. South of there, the warmth continues with temperatures in California's lower deserts, again topping the century mark. In San Francisco, low clouds give way to sunshine with a high of 70 today. For Dodge City, Kansas, a strong morning thunderstorm is followed by clouds breaking for sunshine as the high reaches 80. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist LaTroy Thornton. Remember to follow us everywhere you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. Following concerns that the GOP-led Ohio State Legislature could vote to have President Joe Biden removed from the November election ballot because of a state law regarding certification, Democrats are now planning an unusual move to nominate Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris by a virtual roll call to keep the president on the ballot in that important battleground state. Correspondent Norman Hall reports. President Joe Biden will be formally nominated as the Democratic presidential nominee through a virtual roll call ahead of the party's official convention in Chicago in August. That will allow Biden to appear on the November ballot in Ohio. The Democratic National Convention, where the president would otherwise be formally nominated, comes after Ohio's ballot deadline of August 7th. The party's convention is scheduled for August 19th through the 22nd. The DNC did not say when the virtual roll call will take place, but is expected in the weeks after the committee's June 4th Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting. I'm Norman Hall. There appears to be some good news for Donald Trump, who scored a win of sorts in another legal challenge. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports the federal judge in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case gave the former president's legal team a favorable ruling. 
The judge overseeing Trump's classified documents case in Florida has rejected the government's request to restrict statements by the ex-president that could endanger officers involved in the prosecution. The request came after Trump claimed last week that FBI agents who searched Mar-a-Lago two years ago were authorized to shoot him, distorting a standard use of force policy. Judge Aileen Cannon says prosecutors did not give Trump's lawyers enough time to discuss the request quest before filing it Friday evening. Sagar Magani at the White House. There's some concern in Hollywood as we wake up this morning and it's tied to the box office. We'll tell you how and why when America in the Morning returns after this. The Business Report, sponsored by Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments is a fiduciary, always putting clients' interests first. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. Here's CNBC's Jessica Edinger with Wednesday Business. Wall Street opens this morning after a mixed day yesterday for stocks, but it was historic. The Nasdaq topping 17,000 and closing above it for the first time ever. Uh, this is one of the best years ever in terms of you have a down day, and then the next day does really well. Not surprisingly, it's like the best start ever after 100 days to an election year ever this week. I mean, all in all, just something to think about. The last week of May into about the first week of June historically is kind of a strong okay. period. So in the near term, we think this upward bias is still here. Carson Group's Ryan Dietrich on CNBC. After ticking lower for three months, consumer confidence popped up in the new conference board survey. We're expecting a number around 96 on headline buckle up, a significantly higher number, 102.0, 102.0. CNBC's Rick Santelli. The economy has been firing on all cylinders for sure, except for the housing market. And while mortgage rates have ticked lower, they're not low enough to get people to put their current homes on the market and buy a new one. The challenge really has been this sort of artificial constraint on inventory because so many sellers have locked in a two and three percent rate and they've been unwilling uh, to let go of that which makes sense and so uh, i don't see anytime soon inventory uh, becoming you know flush where we need it to be brown harris stevens best friedman on cnbc porsche unveiled the first ever 911 hybrid sports car Starting price, $164,000. The Scripps Spelling Bee is on in Washington, D.C. The finals are tomorrow night on ION TV. So, Jessica, why is Hollywood super worried this morning? Yeah, because the accountants are going over how much money new movies did not make over the Memorial Day holiday weekend. It's bad for the industry. It was the worst Memorial Day weekend box office in nearly 30 years. That's not counting COVID-2020 when theaters were closed. With Warner Brothers' Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, bringing in just $32 million, it barely beat Garfield. I mean, this is a disaster. If you count for inflation, you've got to go all the way back to the early 80s with a Richard Pryor movie. That's how long it's been since a movie grossed this little and topped the box office. Every, the entire industry thought Furiosa was going to be a hit. It cost $170 million to make. Um, they did a full freight marketing campaign, and they just rejected it outright. Puck's Matt Bellany on CNBC. On today's watch list, we get a lot of earnings reports. Dick's Sporting Goods, Abercrombie & Fitch, Advance Auto Parts, American Eagle Outfitters, Chewy, Salesforce, and HP. Losing it on a plane. Temper, yes. Close, yes. We'll strip that story down for you when America in the Morning returns after these messages. There's an update on sentencing for the man who was found guilty of the home invasion attack on Paul Pelosi, the husband of former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Correspondent Shelley Adler reports. 
The man convicted of attacking the husband of Nancy Pelosi with a hammer two years ago has apologized in federal court, but still received 30 years in prison at an unusual resentencing hearing that resulted from judicial error. David DePap was sentenced on May 17th for 20 years for attempting to kidnap Nancy Pelosi and 30 years for the October 2022 assault on Paul Pelosi. But the judge failed to allow the defendant to address the court at that sentencing, so that's why there was another hearing in which DePap said, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm Shelley Adler. Two people are still unaccounted for and a number of others were injured after an explosion caused extensive damage to a building in downtown Youngstown, Ohio. Photos of the building show severe damage to the first floor and the entire facade was blown off. Authorities report that people in the building reported smelling gas and hearing a boom. Due to the damage, firefighters weren't immediately able to go inside the building until they were sure that it was structurally sound. We've heard about people getting unruly on planes and some getting kicked off flights altogether. But one man in Australia took his clearly illegal activities on a passenger jet to a whole new level. Correspondent Charles de la Desma reports. A man accused of running naked down the aisle of an Australian domestic flight, knocking down a flight attendant and forcing the plane to turn back, was arrested by police at the airport. The incident happened in what was scheduled to be a three-hour, 30-minute Virgin Australia flight on Monday night from the west coast city of Perth to Melbourne on the east. Flight VA696 returned to Perth airport due to a disruptive passenger, an airline statement said. Police add... The man was transferred to hospital for assessment, where he remains. It's not clear how or where on the plane the passenger removed his clothes. I'm Charles de la Desma. America in the Morning for Wednesday, May 29th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm Clayton Neville in for John Trout. And this is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm Clayton Neville in for John Trout. Here's what's coming up this half hour. What's said inside and outside the court in Donald Trump's hush money trial and Trump takes aim at the Texas Speaker of the House. Rough seas have damaged a U.S. bill temporary pier to Gaza. Sagar Magani at the White House. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, will remain behind bars. I'm Bob Brown. I'll have that story. Pope Francis is apologizing after reportedly using a vulgar term about gay men. I'm Rita Foley. Toyota's new engine plants and problems signing up new voters. We'll have that. Are you buying on an online auction? Christie's may have been hacked. I'm Chuck Palm. Bruce Springsteen has pressed pause on touring, but he insists he will be back. I'm Kevin Carr. Back after these messages. Just a couple days left in the month of May as we wake up this morning. Rain again in the forecast for some of us. We bring in LaTroy Thornton now. LaTroy, how long will the risk of severe weather be a factor in the plains? After a Tuesday that brought numerous reports of hail and wind damage from East Texas to Western Oklahoma and Kansas and Eastern Colorado and New Mexico, today and even Thursday are expected to bring more of the same as a complex series of fronts interacts with the flow of warm, moist air lifting out of the Gulf of Mexico. This feature will result in a farther northward potential for hail and strong winds today, stretching border to border from western and central North Dakota to parts of the Texas Gulf Coast. Coverage of severe thunderstorms may not be incredibly widespread each day, but residents will need to stay aware of the potential for dangerous conditions until the storm pushes eastward to end the week. Speaking of the east, the latest disturbance affecting that region brings showers from southern lower Michigan through northern New England today, and the risk for thunder as well across southern New England and as far west as southern Ohio, but dry weather behind the storm in the upper Midwest. This is the last storm for a while, though, ending the latest parade of wet weather as high pressure builds in from the Great Lakes region to end the week, bringing a welcome break from the damp conditions across much of the eastern seaboard, along with lower humidity and cooler days as well, with highs only in the 60s and 70s through at least Saturday for most places from the Mid-Atlantic to the Ohio Valley and the Northeast. In the West, a storm brings continued showers to the Pacific Northwest today, with thunder showers breaking out this afternoon from eastern Idaho into much of Montana and possibly as far south as northern Utah. Elsewhere, the storm track to the north allows for warmth to continue in parts of the Southwest, with another day of triple-digit highs for the lower deserts of California. That's the weather across America. 
I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Latroy Thornton. Remember to follow us everywhere you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. It was a busy day inside the Manhattan courtroom where closing arguments got underway in the Donald Trump hush money case. But it was even busier outside where the former president spoke and so did his surrogates. A shouting match ensued between those for and against the trial that also involved a famous actor. Correspondent Julie Walker reports from New York City. New Yorker and actor Robert De Niro was outside Donald Trump's hush money trial Tuesday with two January 6th officers to put a focus on the former president's actions that day. With Trump, we have a second chance. And no one is laughing now. This is the time to stop him by voting him out once and for all. We don't want to wake up after the election saying, what, again? De Niro says it's all part of Trump's character, making him unworthy of the office. We New Yorkers used to tolerate him when he was just another grubby real estate hustler masquerading as a big shot, a two-bit playboy lying his way into the tabloids, pretending to be a spokesman, a spokesperson for himself. During that news conference, De Niro got into an argument with a Trump supporter. Democrats, you are gangsters. You are gangsters. You are a little fool. You're a softie. You're a nobody. Your movie's You're trash. Trump's campaign held their own news conference with advisor Jason Miller calling out the Oscar winner. The best that Biden can do is roll out a washed up actor. And don't worry, my remarks will be shorter than the Irishman. I won't make you suffer for three hours. But the best they can do is roll out a washed up actor. Donald Trump sat by stoically during closing arguments by one of his defense lawyers in his hush money trial, who spent two and a half hours telling jurors, President Trump is innocent. He did not commit any crimes and the D.A. has not met their burden of proof period, and the evidence in the case should leave you wanting. Trump's attorney also calling star witness Michael Cohen the MVP of liars out to get his former boss. The defense trying to discredit weeks of testimony that prosecutors say proved the former president interfered in the 2016 election through a scheme to suppress stories seen as harmful to his campaign. Make no mistake about it. I'm here because of crooked Joe Biden. The worst president in the history of our country is destroying our country. This country is being destroyed rapidly, not slowly, rapidly, on the borders, on energy, on inflation, on everything you can name. At Criminal Court in Manhattan, I'm Julie Walker. The Republican Speaker of the Texas House overcame opposition last night within his own party to win his runoff election. Speaker Dave Phelan narrowly knocked off David Covey in his Southeast Texas House District. Covey actually was three percentage points ahead of Phelan in the March election, but because neither candidate got 50 percent of the votes, they went to a runoff. Former president and current Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump actually endorsed Covey and blasted Phelan. There is a very important Republican runoff election on Tuesday for many important races up and down the ballot. In particular, Speaker Dade Phelan has done a horrible, absolutely horrible job. He's really been bad at election theft and election interference. He's bad, bad, bad for the Republican Party and democracy. We need him beaten and beaten badly. Now, there's no proof that Phelan's been tied up in any election fraud. It's Republican infighting on full display in Texas. Trump, an ally of Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and the state's Attorney General Ken Paxton, both who have a beef with Phelan. The House Speaker led the way in Paxton's impeachment trial. He was acquitted on abuse of power charges, and Patrick has long butted heads with Phelan and made it quite clear that he supported Phelan's opponent in the race. Phelan spoke about that. Typically, we stay out of each other's races. Of course, the lieutenant governor decided not to follow that tradition. He crossed that Rubicon, um, and that's, that's, his, that's his issue going forward with the Texas House. The tradition of the Texas House is the lieutenant governor, the governor, and the speaker stay in their lanes. Phelan's victory means the divide among Republicans in the Texas legislature is here to stay, at least for now, with another legislative session still months away. Phelan released a statement after his victory last night saying, quote, we set our own course. Our community is not for sale and our values are not up for auction. 
In the Middle East, millions of dollars were spent to build a temporary pier to allow for humanitarian aid to enter Gaza from the Mediterranean Sea. But rough waters have now damaged that U.S.-built pier and also crippled some ships helping with the aid. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports. Rough seas have damaged a U.S. bill temporary pier that's being used to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza. The pier proved highly valuable in delivering aid to the people of Gaza. Thus, upon completion of the pier, repair and reassembly, the intention is to re-anchor the temporary pier to the coast of Gaza and resume humanitarian aid to the people who need it most. Three U.S. officials tell the AP the pier's operations are now temporarily suspended due to the damage. That's just the latest setback after the pier became operational last week. Four of the Army boats being used to ferry aid from commercial vessels to the pier became unmoored over the weekend. And there have also been three U.S. troop injuries. The pier has been providing an extra way to get critically needed aid into Gaza. Sagar Magani at the White House. An apology from the Pope. We'll tell you what for when America in the Morning returns. Stay with us. The man who terrorized New York City in the 1970s and became known as the 44 caliber killer during a series of late night shootings will remain in prison, denied parole for the 12th time. Correspondent Bob Brown has details. For the 12th time, convicted serial killer David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, will remain behind bars in an upstate New York prison after confessing to the shooting deaths of six people, young women, couples, who were just innocently sitting in their cars. The killings began in New York City in July of 1976, police saying he used a 44 caliber handgun on his victims. He was finally caught a little over a year later, authorities sifting through parking tickets, tracing his car at his home in Yonkers. Berkowitz which was sentenced in 1978 to 25 years to life for each of the murders. Here he is in a true crime podcast two years ago in a jailhouse interview. To bring clarity to certain things, I can't talk about everything. I don't want to talk about crimes specifically. There's no reason to. Son of Sam in reference to his neighbor named Sam and Sam's dog. Berkowitz claims the dog ordered him to kill. Berkowitz, who was 70, was rejected after a border parole prison interview on May 14th, according to information listed on a State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision website. Bob Brown, New York. With the 2024 general election less than six months away, depending on where you live, there are new state laws that are making it harder for third-party groups to register voters. Correspondent Jennifer King reports. After the 2020 election, several Republican-controlled states passed legislation that was promoted as cracking down on voter fraud. Most of those laws are facing court challenges. In Florida, the League of Women Voters say they've had to shift to digital outreach while fighting a law that tightened registration paperwork deadlines and enhanced criminal fines and penalties. Kansas passed a bill that made it a felony if anyone registering voters was assumed to impersonate an election official. Anita Alexander with Loud Light Kansas says they've had to stop registration efforts because would-be voters perceive their staff as election workers even when told otherwise. Voting rights experts say the laws contribute to a culture of fear and strip access to the ballot box, especially for minority voters. I'm Jennifer King. It's an about face for Pope Francis, who's apologizing for something he reportedly said. Correspondent Rita Foley reports. Francis's comments came in a closed-door meeting with Italian bishops on May 20th. Media quoted unnamed bishops in reporting that Francis jokingly used the term while underlining the Vatican's ban on allowing gay men to enter seminaries and be ordained priests. A Vatican spokesman says Francis was aware of the storm that erupted over his comments. The spokesman said the Pope has made outreach a hallmark of his papacy and has long insisted that there was room for everyone in the Catholic Church. He said the Pope never intended to offend or express himself in homophobic terms, and he extends his apologies to those who were offended. I'm Rita Foley. As some EV sales have slowed, Toyota plans on a futuristic spin on the traditional internal combustion engine that doesn't rely completely on all electric vehicles. Correspondent Lisa Dwyer reports. 
While many competitors are pushing for fully electric vehicles, Toyota says it will offer lean, compact engines that also run on so-called green fuels like hydrogen and bioethanol or with zero emissions electric motors and hybrids. Toyota says that the carbon neutrality the world is aspiring towards is not likely attainable for decades to come. Toyota says that energy supply conditions differ globally with products having to meet various customer needs and that the investments needed for mass producing battery electric vehicles are enormous. Toyota also says that millions of jobs are at stake in Japan and that a sudden shift to electric cars was not economically possible or socially responsible. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Online auctions are always under suspicion for their safety and authenticity, but world-famous Christie's is above reproach. Well, now it seems even they're not immune to the dark deeds done by ransom-seeking cyber criminals. Here's Chuck Palm with today's tech news. Famed auction house Christie's has reported a cyber attack that has caused the auctioneers to close down their website shortly before their key spring sales. Ransom Hub has claimed responsibility, and on a post in the dark web, the hacker group claimed that it has acquired access to sensitive information about some of the world's wealthiest art collectors and that Christie's has declined to pay a ransom. New York Times says they weren't immediately able to verify the claims, but the CEO, Guillaume Sicutti, had posted on LinkedIn verifying the unauthorized access to parts of Christie's network. A spokesperson for Christie's said that there's no evidence that financial or transactional records were compromised and they would be communicating with the affected clients in the next 48 hours. Sakuti assured people on Facebook that they are complying with all regulatory and governmental obligations and have made appropriate notifications to privacy regulators. As of early yesterday evening, the website has been restored and auctions resume at Christie's. Leave a comment at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. It's time for sports brought to you by Untuck It. Get your Father's Day gifts at our 80 plus stores or untuckit.com. Untuck It shirts designed to be worn untucked. Here's Robert Workman. NBA playoffs, the Timberwolves edge the Mavericks 105-100 to stay alive in the Western Conference Finals. Minnesota grabbed the early lead, but Dallas got even by halftime, and it went back and forth from there until midway through the fourth quarter when Carl Anthony Towns banged in three straight three balls to put the Wolves ahead to stay. He fouled out with 25 points. Anthony Edwards had 29. Luka Doncic, 28 points and a triple-double for the Mavs, who lead the series 3-1. It's back to Minneapolis for Game 5 tomorrow. The T-Wolves have now won three elimination games this postseason, but they need three more to get to the NBA Finals. WNBA, Caitlin Clark had 30 points, but her fever lost for the seventh time in their first eight games. Stanley Cup playoffs, the Eastern Conference Final is all even at 2-2. The Panthers beat the Rangers 3-2 in overtime to capture Game 4. Sam Reinhart scored on the power play a minute 12 into OT. Tonight, Game 4 in the West Final in Edmonton. The Stars lead the Oilers 2-1. Baseball, Corey Seager's three-run blast boosted the Rangers over the Diamondbacks 4-2. Seager has hit seven dingers in the last seven games. Games. He had three against Arizona in last year's World Series. Guardians gouged the Rockies 13-7. Josh Naylor with two of Cleveland's four home runs. Cubs bounced the Brewers in 10 innings. Ben Brown held the crew hitless through seven with 10 Ks for Chicago. Padres blanked the Marlins. Matt Waldron and company with a six-hitter. Braves shut out the Nationals. Eight strong innings for Max Freed. A's repelled the Rays. Mitch Spence and the Gifts with a three-hit gem. Miguel Andujar, a three-run rocket. Today we play, we play really good defense. Spence throw really good baseball. I think I think everybody played good. I think that's the key for winning this game today, too. Giants outlasted the Phillies 1-0 in 10 innings. Dodgers swept two from the Mets. Wins for the Angels, Blue Jays, Red Sox, Cardinals, Twins, and Mariners. Pirates and Tigers were postponed. They'll play two today. At the French Open, men's top seed Novak Djokovic won his first-round match. Second-round play today, women's number one Iga Sviantec faces Naomi Osaka. That's Wednesday Sports. A famous American musician postponing shows because of his voice. We've got details and we'll tell you who when America in the Morning returns after these messages. The man who produced The Godfather, among other major movies, has passed away. Entertainment correspondent Margie Zaraleta reports on the death of producer Albert Ruddy. Keep your friends close, 
put your enemies close. Real life mobsters were trying to shut down production of The Godfather until Albert S. Ruddy met with crime boss Joseph Colombo and made a few changes to the script. Now you come to me and you say, Don Corleone, and give me justice. But you don't ask with respect. You don't offer friendship. You don't even think to call me Godfather. Ruddy won an Oscar for that movie, as well as one for producing Million Dollar Baby. Now the truth is, my brother's in prison. My sister cheats on welfare by pretending one of her babies is still alive. My daddy's dead and my mama weighs 312 pounds. If I was thinking straight, I'd go back home, find a used trailer, buy a deep fryer and some Oreos. The problem is, this is the only thing I ever felt good doing. If I'm too old for this, then I got nothing. Had enough truth to suit you. He also produced The Longest Yard and Cannonball Run. They want to bless us. Can we? Let me get this straight. You want us to pull over and be blessed by a black priest in a red Ferrari. Couldn't hurt? I say. Ruddy also co-created the TV shows Hogan's Heroes and Walker, Texas Ranger. I'm Archie Zaroleta. Fans of The Boss are hoping for the best after Bruce Springsteen postponed some of his shows because of an unspecified vocal issue. Kevin Carr has the story. Bruce Springsteen has a message for his fans. Hey, this is Bruce Springsteen. I'm in Marseille. Unfortunately, I could not sing for you. But we will be back to give you the show of your life. Last week, the Born in the USA singer had to press pause on his European tour, citing unspecified vocal issues. Originally, Saturday's concert in Marseille was canceled. However, under doctor's direction, three more dates were postponed, one in Prague and two in Milan. During an appearance in London last week, Springsteen blamed his vocal issues on the infamously dreary weather in the UK. Then, in an Instagram post on Monday, he thanked his fans in Europe and assured them things would be starting up again. But we will be back to Marseille, to Prague, and to Milan. We'll be back, coming back to Madrid and Barcelona, where we plan to rock you. While the 74-year-old performer has not specified the medical issue, he has had to cancel shows before, most notably after some a peptic ulcer during the North American tour last fall. The condition affects the stomach and digestion, but can impact his ability to perform, he explained to Jim Rotolo on Sirius XM's E Street Radio in March. Well, one of the big problems was I couldn't sing. You sing with your diaphragm. You know, my diaphragm was hurting so badly that when I went to make the effort to sing, it was killing me. Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band plan to resume their European Stadium Tour in Madrid on June 12th. I'm Kevin Carr. America in the Morning for Wednesday, May 29th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm Clayton Neville in for John Trout, and this is Westwood One.